Well, good morning, Lighthouse. Uh, it's great to see you guys at least engaging and stuff in the chat uh, today. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to jump in uh, to a what I'm calling a needed conversation today. Uh, you're aware of everything that's happening in our world, and I think given given the time, um, uh, I'll say this: the, the heightened awareness that many of us have. I want to say this: that as your pastor of a pastor of a predominantly white church, we need to lean into a conversation. We need to have a conversation, and actually, you don't need to hear much from me during this conversation. We need to hear from some of our brothers and sisters. And so to set up where I want our conversation, what I'm praying uh, will happen in this conversation is that before we even exit out of this, because this isn't Pastor Kevin up on a stage screaming at you that you're gonna make it through the valley and that God's gonna answer your prayer, that we're actually gonna jump into a conversation that many of us need to actually address in our own lives personally, myself included, and that we need to face. And I wanna just, just set up before we, we, we jump into this, and I wanna to go to John chapter four. Because I think Jesus, he actually demonstrates this and paints this picture. He actually invites us into a journey with him in John chapter four, that I actually think is what you and I, as white people, we need to do. We need to take a journey through Samaria. And we need to sit and we need to listen. In John chapter four, it's interesting because the scripture says in, in John chapter four and verse five that Jesus, that he had to, go through Samaria. It's an interesting thought because at that time, uh, Jews and Samaritans did not get along, and every other Jewish leader would go the long way around Samaria to get to their destination, and yet Jesus makes it a point in Scripture and actually invites us into this story that actually took place, and He actually journeys into Samaria. And as He journeys into Samaria, he, He's going to meet with this woman at a well, and as Jesus goes to meet with these women, this woman, I should say, at the well, his disciples end up and they, they go and get some lunch. They, they were preoccupied with, with feeding their stomach with something. And so they set out to go grab lunch and Jesus actually presses into a conversation here. And I just want to read a few verses for us. John chapter four, I'll start in verse four. It says, he had to go through Samaria on the way. It said, eventually he came to the Samaritan village of, si of Sychar near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily at the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. Woman was surprised for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew. I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, if only you knew the gift of God that God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. And they enter into this conversation and this woman who has had several men involved in her life, this woman who has been disapproved, who has been outcast from society for quite some time, is now having a conversation with Jesus, with, with God in skin and bones. And she has this conversation with Jesus that radically changes her life. And it's interesting because towards the end of this, this text and this story, the disciples of Jesus actually show back up. And it says as the disciples of Jesus show back up, and they see Jesus having this conversation with this Samaritan woman. They're appalled, they don't know what to say, they, they understand their customs and their culture. We're not supposed to be talking to one another. Jesus, what are you doing? And so they try to deflect it and say, Jesus, um, did you have McDonald's for lunch? Like, where, where, where's your food? And Jesus basically says, listen, I've got some food that you know nothing about. And it's interesting because I've always preached this text, church, that the woman was so amazed at the presence of God and the love that, were in the, that was in the eyes of the Father that she dropped her bucket and she left there back into her village to tell everyone about a man that she met. And reading it this week, this jumped out to me and spoke to me because I think there's, there, there's even more to this story. Could it possibly be that this lady dropped her bucket the moment the disciples showed up because the disciples actually reminded her of the unapproval, of the unacceptance, and it flared back up all of the emotions and feelings that she had to process through. 
My prayer for us church is not only would we look like the disciples, but I want us as a church to look like Jesus. And in order for us to look like Jesus, we need heart transformation to take place. And part of that heart transformation is to actually hear from some of our brothers and sisters firsthand what it's like to not be white, to not walk through what we've had to walk through and actually hear the challenge of several of, uh, of, of, I'll say the pain and everyday stuff that you and I may take for granted. So I'm not gonna do much more talking from here on out and I'm gonna allow our friends to talk and I wanna just, just have everybody introduce themselves and I'm gonna first go here oh, to yeah. Miss, come on, I'm Pastor Cynthia, come on, yes. no, no guest to Lighthouse <laughs> Church. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm Pastor Cynthia and um, I tell you what, I have uh, been a lover of people Mm. all kinds of people. Mm. I'm a multicultural chick. <laughs> I'm into that. And, uh, but in this present hour, uh, there is a shift and a move uh, that is needed in the landscape of our society, a route that we want to uproot. And I believe the church has yep. the answer. Yep. I'm a mom of two children. I'm a single mama. And uh, mm. uh, I'm glad to be here with my brother's Mm. and sisters <laughs> to uh, have a conversation that I know we all need to have. Mm. Yep. Pastor Rudy. <laughs> uh, Pastor Rudy, uh, Pastor Church in West LA. And uh, um, I uh, consider myself West Coast, Alabama. All my folks <laughs> is uh, from Birmingham and Alabama, but I was born and raised here. So uh, I'm a Southern kid with a little bit of a West Coast flair. And uh, that's how I do life. And I want to piggyback uh, what Kevin said as we go through this conversation. Uh, many scholars say that although to, to go to Samaria, the Jews would take the long route, uh, many Jews consider it the easy route. And even though it was longer, they thought of it as easier because they didn't have to confront wow. their issues. Wow. Uh, they didn't have to get uncomfortable. They didn't have to do any inner work. Um, they could stay in their comfort zones. My prayer is that at the end of this conversation, you'll be willing um, to take the short route, the more difficult route, and go directly to people of color, um, build relationships, um, learn and become. So that's, that's my hope from today. And I, I'm gonna brag on Rudy real quick. Rudy and I have probably known each other for eight or nine years now, and pastors a diverse multicultural church. And, you know, I'll just jump into this and say this. I, have, I don't know if I've ever shared this with you, one of the things that, that from the time that I met you that I appreciated is how you as, as a six foot, what are you, six foot five? Six four. Six four, four I yeah. gave you an extra inch. <laughs> as a six foot four black man actually said yes to pastoring in a white community, uprooting their family and investing their family in a predominantly white community where culturally racism and even historically racism was deep ingrained in that community. And what that spoke to this 23, 24 year old youth pastor, observing somebody being willing to go on the front lines and not, not allow this to, to be something that was going to continue to, to separate people, but actually to, to lead that way. Uh, I just commend you for it, and, and it has spoken volumes to me and has, uh, I think, encouraged me to want to press into differences. Man, we record. I'm not blushing. That's not happening. That's not happening. <laughs> John McBride, come on, introduce yourself, my friend. Hello, everyone here at Lighthouse. Uh, you all know me. Um, I'm John McBride. Been at Lighthouse since 2017. Um, you know, I wrestled with, with coming here today and, and speaking. Um, you know, uh, I think I, I touch on a lot of different areas. You know, I'm black, but I'm also a police officer. And in this current state of affairs, uh, there's a lot going on surrounding police, and, and it hurts. Um, not only that, um, I'm married to a white woman with biracial kids, and um, this is a real topic. But I never, I, when I grew up, I was never raised to see color, um, you know. But uh, the reality is, is that I'm black, and uh, these things have been taking place for a long time. And um, I know God gave me a voice, and you know, I just want to share my story with you all, so that hopefully it'll open your eyes, and we can all learn to uh, dialogue with each other, so we can move further uh, passes. 
know what I appreciate about John mm, so is yeah, in every environment that I'm in and John McBride shows up, there's a peace that comes over that environment. Yeah. Like, you know it's going to be okay. You, you have that, 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 definitely that spirit, that personality that's just like, mm-hmm. I've seen you in intense conversations, maybe that I've put us in in some basketball games and you've just kind of <laughs> smoothed, smoothed it out. And uh, I, I just appreciate that about you, John. You, you mm-hmm. just, everywhere you go, you've been, you just even kilter. You never, you, highs or lows, you just, the way that you come across and love people, I, I greatly appreciate. Amen. You know, I, uh, Cynthia, I think I, I, I'll come here um, and just start with you, because here's um, where I want to go. Earlier this week, we were on a, a call with our, our council, our, our church leadership. Yeah. And, um, we, we just pressed into a conversation mm-hmm. and you shared for probably three minutes mm-hmm. and uh, it broke my heart. It broke every other uh, person's heart that was, mm-hmm. was on that. Mm-hmm. And just the reality of listening to things that, that even um, we have taken for granted mm-hmm. for quite some time. And, and I don't know, not just rehashing some of that, but I think mm-hmm. expressing mm-hmm. so that we actually hear and understand that this isn't some issue for some other people somewhere off. This is a sister, a part of our church community and has been for well over 10 years. And I think it's important for people to hear. Thank you. Well, you know, I was, uh, this has been pretty pensive given the circumstances uh, right now, but some of the things that, that, that really is reeking deeply with me is that I have six black male nephews and I have a black male son. And the navigation of standing by the door, hoping they get home okay, or having to have a conversation of uh, how you drive while being black, uh, this has been a, a, a system that has been overwhelming, that has changed the trajectory of, of young black males living freely. Without, without fear. Times when my nephew, while he was headed to be a star basketball player, he was abused by a white coach to the point where it just broke his spirit. And we know that the spirit, when it's broken, creates dry bones. Mm. And knowing that when I worked in LA uh, for a theater company, I was, I, I love theater and I was a student and I went to volunteer in a white area at a theater. I don't know if you're familiar with Overland, mm. but <laughs> I went there and I served as, uh, as a, uh, a popcorn checker. Well, by the time the show started, I was the only one out there. Five white people ran out thinking that I was going to steal the money and they assumed that I came from the welfare department. Mm. And, and these kind of profilings are, are, are the kind of profiles that you never live down. You know, you, you try to be the best you you could be in this context, but it continually, it's a perpetual uh, uh, environment where we are thought of in a certain perspective. And all of us, yeah wear the jacket of one black person making a mistake. Mm -hmm. All of us walk and try to avoid each other in groups (laughs) in order to not make people feel uncomfortable. So we we do this Lone Ranger thing like, oh God, there's another black person. We gotta make sure we protect each other. So let's just play like we don't Mm. see each other, Mm. right? And we've never said that out loud, but we know that we navigate that way for our own protection. Mm. And so I believe in mm. that God has, has a call on the church, yeah. this heart disease mm. that he's looking to, to, to heal mm. from generations to generations to generate. We can't go back, but what we can do, we could bring a healing balm by telling stories, by repurposing the narrative that has been given to us mm. and by getting us in a time where we can come together face to face and learn who each other is mm. in order for God's kingdom to be expanded and exploded. Wow. Things that, that yeah, I mean, I, I'll say, you just, I never have to think about that. I've never had to, and I've been pulled over a few times, and um, 
never once was I scared or did my parents have to teach me how to act when I was pulled over by a police. Like, it's just things that we take for granted. I think about a time, Rudy, when we were at a nice place. We're both sitting at a table and it's just, it, it, it's, it's small comments. And let me say it this way, because most people will say, oh, I'm not racist. Yeah. But what comes out of the mouth is from the heart, right? And even in jokes and sarcasm, even in, in subconscious, and I've been guilty of this, like have, have communicated subconscious things and it's actually exposed things in my heart. And one of the, we're, we're sitting at a nice place, we're sitting around a table and I'm with my six foot four six foot. black friend and I'm, I'm this little white guy and we have this conversation with this server at the table. And you probably remember this, what does the server say? She says, oh, is this your bodyguard? As if, as if because I'm, I, I'm some little white guy and he happens to be a six foot four black man that we can't be friends, that he actually had to be a bodyguard of mine. Not only can we not be friends, we can't be peers. Right. So yeah, if, yeah. if African Americans yeah. are sitting at a table in a restaurant, or if it, it's, it's an African American, it, say it's three African Americans and one white guy, the waitress is gonna ask the white guy Mm -hmm. uh, for the bill, because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. they expect the white person to pay, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. African Americans cannot be peers. Mm -hmm. We have to somehow, in some way, be subservient. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So. yeah. Let, let me jump in yeah, on, on on just the the African American experience. I am currently in a Facebook thread, um, and the Facebook thread is asking the question: um, When was the first time that you had a gun pulled out on you? Uh, by the cops. And as you go through this thread, um, and it's, uh, it's, it's just going on and on and on, um, you, you, see, you see guys and ladies saying 12, 11, 8. The last time um, I had a gun um, pulled out on me by a cop, my wife and I, I think I was in my 30s, I think we're probably mid-30s, something like that. And uh, we're sitting in the, um, you know, blockbuster parking lot. <laughs> I'm about my age a little bit. <laughs> Back in the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For those of you watching yeah. who don't know what a blockbuster is, Google it. <laughs> um, and uh, me and my wife are having this wonderful discussion. She was killing me. I was getting destroyed. And, uh, um, and so, you know, it, you know, black woman, she, she gets going. She can get going. And it was going. And, uh, and uh, before we knew it, um, I don't know how many cars, but several, five, six, four, five, six police cars pulled up. A helicopter. They say, get out the car. I'm with my wife. A man's primary instinct uh, when he loves his wife is to protect his wife. And they are pulling out guns. First time uh, I had uh, an officer pull out a gun on me, I was 20. Um, I didn't start driving until about 18, and so this is just two years into driving. I've been pulled over a few times, no reason. You fit the description, you know, that kind of thing. But this time, the officer pulls me over, and he says, um, you know, license registration. I'm, I'm getting it for him. I had the talk. You know, black people, we get the talk, so I did everything right, you know, 10 and 2, and yes, sir, and, you know, the whole thing. Um, and then he goes, uh, get out the car. And I go, yes, sir. I, I didn't do any of the why, you know, I didn't do, I don't know my rights, I didn't do it. Yes, sir. I get out the car, he pulls out a gun, and I go, hey, man, you asked me to get out the car. And he's shaking. Mm -hmm. I was afraid he was gonna shoot me on accident. Oh, God. And that, that is the norm. Mm -hmm. that, that Facebook thread, the, the black experience, um, is to be assumed to be a criminal. Mm -hmm. um, I've been put on the ground, and there's no criminality in my background. Uh, I've been a church, I, I'm not that good, but I've been a church kid my whole life. Mm -hmm. um, no reason to pull me over. Yeah. No reason to put me on the ground. Mm -hmm. No reason to pull out a gun on me. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the pain, the, the fear. The trauma. The trauma involved in that. I go to John, because this is, I, I love this. I love pressing <laughs> into the messy conversation, because mm -hmm. a lot of people have these talks and they want to invite a police officer to be with them. So I, I wanted to jump into the messiness a bit of that and invite a, a police officer into this conversation, because you, you deal with this every single day. You know, uh, you know, hearing that story, hearing your story too, Cynthia, it breaks my heart, you know, as a police officer, because I know when I go out there, 
you know, and I lace up my boots and I put on my uniform and that badge, uh, I go out there to serve and protect and to make a difference, you know. But I know that's not, I know that's not um, how black people feel because as a police officer, I felt it myself, you know, being pulled over before by officers, you know, and going through the steps. And it's like, why is that? Why do I feel that? Um, and that's because this is so deep rooted um, in history, you know, and um, regardless of where you came from, for me, I grew up out here in, in Ventura County, so I wasn't subjected to um, a lot of racism and things that you may have been subjected to where you were from. Um, so I didn't feel the effect like that. And I was guarded too because I had an older brother who wanted to protect me. So I was, a, a lot of these things were oblivious to me. I was oblivious to it, you know, and, and, and blind. But as I got older and I started to see what was going on in society, you know, what was being portrayed in TV, in the movies, you know, I started to realize like this affects all black people and I'm no exception to the rule, even though I'm a police officer, yeah. I still feel that effect you know, because of the color of my skin. And, uh, I think just to, because I think as thinking about the, our, our church on the other side of the screen, it, sometimes it's hard for us to swallow and hear that because we, we, um, we have been part of a system that has been created by people that look like us. Uh, a pastor I greatly admire, his name is Miles McPherson, and he has a book called The Third Option. It's interesting, and in that book he talks about a right-hand dominant world. We don't think about this, but to, to, to think of it this way, that um, you, you look at this desk at school, right? Every desk at school was created for a right-handed individual. You don't believe me, ask a left-handed person. It's why you, you notice they're, they're mm -hmm. tweaked their bodies and stuff. Okay, let's go even deeper. Let's think about a coffee mug. A coffee mug was designed by a right-handed person. It's why when you hold a coffee mug with your right hand, the logo faces the right way. But when you grab that coffee mug with the left hand, what happens with that logo? It's not good or bad. It's just that when those things were created, they were created by a group of right-handed people that were building something for people that were like them. And so what, what has happened a lot of times is the reason we have a tough time, he goes on to talk about identifying, is because we don't understand what it's like to think and pause and hear what it's like to, to write with our left hand, to hold a mug, with our left hand, and we know this, and this is what he ultimately goes on to talk about, that heaven on earth is when both hands are actually being utilized together. Mm -hmm. And that's the conversation, that, that's really what we're trying to, mm -hmm. to, to convey, is can we, can we pause for a moment, and can we actually reflect and understand, church, that maybe some of the ways that we preconceived thoughts that we've had have been so conditioned that we have taken things for granted and have completely overlooked things because we have, 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 have not even thought about it from somebody else's perspective. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think a, a huge uh, uh, purpose that, that, that John brought up and, and Pastor Rudy is that, you know, we all are black people, but we've had very different experiences. And I think mm -hmm. that in order for us to move to a new level and a new understanding is that to begin to see not just the whole people group, but see Cynthia, yep. see Pastor Rudy, yep. see John, yep. and see whoever else as individuals and, and be curious enough to, to want to know them as not only people of God, but humanity. Uh, yeah. Because we've been clumped and our experiences are very different. My, my parents, when we were growing up, I lived in a middle class family and my father guarded us from all of that. I didn't get to start seeing uh, racism at its best until I got older. But the racism that I saw was institutionalized. Mm. So it was very, very subtle. It was in the workplace. You know, it was in school. Mm. It was in all of the day-to-day -day activities, mm. which is different than the blatant, you know, pull a gun or, or get out of the car kind of thing. Yeah. But that was still a fear for, uh, for our family growing up, you know. I, there's a this thought I've been wrestling with, Pastor Rudy's wife and I just talked about it a little bit ago. If we really are gonna understand the scripture, that, that Jesus did die and he loves all people and we are commissioned to love all people. 
if we have racism, even just an issue in our heart with an individual that was created in the image of God, Here's a deeper question. Do I have an issue that I need to resolve with God? And do I, do I need to say, God, I'm, I need you to actually transform that inside of me. And it, it, it is a, let me say it this way. I, I probably said this earlier, I don't know if I did or not. I'm gonna say things wrong. And I, here's the, where I'm going with this. I'm not gonna say everything perfectly. Um, I'm gonna say things that probably offend white people and that offend black people. Um, all I know is for me, I'm not okay with being silent. Um, I wanna say something and use my voice and the influence and platform that God's entrusted me with to at least say something. And I think by saying something, at least we're jumping into a conversation. Yeah, I'm, I'm, let me jump in there. I, I think the, the, the say something uh, is part of the frustration that's being expre expressed right now. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. uh, as yeah. uh, as an African American who uh, um, I was, I grew up in Compton, um, and when I was in Compton, it was 90, 95 percent African American, um, and I think I thought, um, well, if they just knew me. If they just saw my humanity, that they they would know that um, that we're no different than them. Um, and then then to find out that that's not true, um, even when um, you, you have a relationship with me, you know my wife, you know my kids, you you you've seen how I do life. Um, and even even African Americans who who don't have the level of um, diverse relationships that I have mm -hmm. um, with 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 the advent of social media. Um, the, the assumption was that if you just saw the videos, if you just knew, uh, if you were aware of what was going on, it, well, maybe you need to see it more than once. And when that didn't matter, and it still became, well, we're going to wait until the investigation comes out. When, when, when that's not the perspective, when it's, it's uh, a, a, a white kid, uh, but when, it, when it's a black kid, it's always, well, he had to be doing something. Mm -hmm. Oh, he was murdered because he had something in his system. As, as if kids of other, uh, our white kids uh, don't do drugs, like white kids don't. And because I have relationships with all kind of people, I know we, people aren't any different. Right. People are people. Right. Yeah. But there's this, this stigma and this assumption um, and this, this blinder. Mm -hmm. um, and we need you to say something. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. if you are a white person, it is betrayal to us, mm -hmm. uh, in particular to know us mm -hmm. and not speak up. Right. as it would be betrayal to you if your best friend didn't speak up for you. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. why is it that we don't speak up? You know, what, what, what would you say? Is it, is it fear of saying the wrong thing? Is it, is it I mean, there's, there's reasons why people try to reason in their mind why they don't. I've been talking, so I'm gonna say one quick <laughs> yeah. Because white people know that the system will protect itself. Mm. Mm -hmm. White people know if I say something, my white friends are going to protect this white structure. Mm. Yes. Mm. White people will say, what is structural racism? What is systemic racism? Mm -hmm. Well, it's that thing that stops you from speaking up when you know you should speak up mm -hmm. because you know how your friends are gonna react. Mm -hmm. And so you're like, I, I don't want any parts of that. I'll just be a good person in my heart and be nice to the people that I know. Be indifferent. You, because you, well, they, they're not even indifferent. They know mm -hmm. and they care, mm -hmm. but they refuse mm -hmm. to speak up mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. because they know the system will protect itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so John, mm -hmm. when you see a white pastor speaking up for injustice as a police officer, and I mean, I've, I posted several things and took, um, let's just say, pleasant responses from people. And it, I think, John, my, my frustration, and maybe you can help me with this, is I, I've always leaned this way, I think my wife knows this, is if there is a portion of society that is hurting and broken. Scripture says several times that Jesus was moved with compassion. What did he say? He said, blessed are the poor. Okay, when he says blessed are the poor, I, I could imagine some of the rich people's there saying, well, what about the rich people? Well, what, well, what about, well, it was almost as if Jesus knew that there was a portion that was being marginalized. And, and, and even just by him addressing and being moved with compassion and leaning into it, even, even biasly, even leaning in strategically mm -hmm. to a group of people, 
that, that are hurting. And, and I had a conversation with a white friend this week that was frustrated with me. And I just said, it, it, the best way I can describe it is, let's say we're in a housing community and um, there is a house that is clearly burning down and on fire. And for us to say all houses matter, we just asked the fire department to start throwing water on all the houses and not rushing to the emergency of the fire that's burning. And I think by, by, by saying something, it's saying, hey, time out, Th there is a house that's burning. Can we draw near and put our efforts towards the house that is burning? So when, I, when, when you hear that as a, as a police officer, as a African-American black gentleman, what, what is it that, that you hear, I think, is what I think is a ben beneficial conversation for people that, that, that are hesitant maybe to speak up because I don't want to offend our frontline workers. Um, you know, when I, you asked me that question, but I know your heart and I know you, um, and you speak out because you know that something needs to be said, but I think so many uh, white people are afraid to speak out because they don't know what to say. And if they do say something, they're gonna, they feel like they're gonna feel backlash. And um, with everything that's just going on in society, they, they don't know what to say. But sometimes they just need to stand with, you know, and support if they don't know what to say in these moments, you know, because that speaks volumes. Um, and, I, and as a police officer, you know, it only makes sense to go to the problem and handle the problem, you know, um, rather than address what is not, you know, and uh, does that make sense? Absolutely. You know, so. You know, I just wanted to take that a little deeper. It, it, uh, the framework of the, the, the way that black people are looked at is that they're all poor. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. Or that they all need Jesus. Hmm. <laughs> See, hmm. but from a social economic hmm. stance, we have levels hmm. of black people in different social economic state statuses. And it's often thought of is that, oh, all black people are poor. Mm. They're not. Mm. And I think, uh, but that's learning and coming together and hearing stories and, and us creating our own narratives versus narratives that have been created for us. And we have been silent on so many fronts. Uh, but at the same time, it, it's time to hear our stories. Mm -hmm. And it's time to take those stories in and really look back at, okay, how, where am I standing in this? Or have I just put blinders on because it's not close to my house, mm -hmm. right? You talked about the yeah. burning house. Um, but uh, it's going back to targeting people individually, their individual humanity, yep. and not the masses that all of us are the same, or all of us have the same experience, mm -hmm. or all of us, it's same with white people. right? Right. There are very, there are poor, poor yeah. white people. Yeah. There are people middle class who are white. It goes on and on. And so really uh, breaking the chains of all of these labels that where we have put people in little sandboxes uh, because it seems like it makes life easier or more manageable. Uh, and I, I, Kevin, I really appreciate you, Pastor, because what you're saying is like, let's break open the can. Yeah. Let's break open the can and let's enter in and let's begin to, to do some, some transforming. Let's begin to grapple with things. Let's begin to, to, to speak about uh, hard uh, things because the church is called yeah. to go into those yeah. hard crevices sure. and yeah. places. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So. I think How a lot do you of people today? Uh, go ahead. I'll say, uh, just to kind of touch on that, I, I think a lot of people don't even understand that they feel a certain type of way in regards to what's going on because mm -hmm. it's generational and it's, yeah. it's something that's been embedded in them since they were kids. It's something that they grew up with, that they saw on TV, that they were told, you know, how society portrayed black people. And although in these times, a lot of white people may not feel like that's not how I feel towards black people. That's not how they act towards black people because they don't realize that all this stuff is internal. Yeah, and what it's, it's something that's been going on it's the implicit bias that has been formed yeah. mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. yeah. and they don't even know what's going on or how to address it mm. when the situation is put right in front of them yeah you that's know? good, so, good. good yeah. Yeah. Rudy let me ask you this 
because um, I think it's helpful. I, I had a conversation today with, uh, he's a white man, but he's a president of a very, very large company that, that I mean, in the multi, multi-millions. And we had, the conversation today was, he's like, I've addressed it internally. How, how do I roll this out? How, what, what, how do I even navigate that? How do I lead in this, this time? And Because it's, it's more than just making a statement, but the statement, I feel like, has to be said. And so how, how do we, as, as, let me just, as leaders, maybe people that lead a business on the other side of this, how do we address this? How, how are you, in, in your church, the people that you lead, that God's entrusted you to, how do you lead through that? First, what, is, what does he mean by he's addressed it internally? What with, with, with his employees, but, but they're, they're a, a sales-based company, so they've got customers and clients okay. uh, that, that are very, very high-end clients. And... Um, the wrestling ground and, and pushback that he's got about not sending anything out yet from some of his clients. Like, where, where, where's your voice in this? And I, I think that's the, the, the how do we, what, what, what is your advice to that individual? Do I just sit here and be silent? And okay. pe because people, here's what we like to say, people just know my heart. And I, and I encourage them, this is what I said, and I'm pro I mean, you're gonna say something far wiser than I am. I said, yeah, the people close to you know your heart, but a company of your size, you're hoping that the people close to you that know your heart are conveying that message to their next layer of leadership and the next layer of leadership. And, and you're hoping that, that your heart is being communicated through that. It's not necessarily the case. Yeah. Yeah. Coming straight from the boss's mouth is a whole nother thing. Okay, I mean, that's a huge question. Yes. So, um, um, I don't know how well I'm gonna answer it, but let me say this. Um, kind of piggybacking off what was yeah. said going into that. Yeah. Um, black people are not a monolithic, yep. and, mm -hmm. and neither are we a single story. Yep. No. Uh, and when, when you view an entire people group that way, um, not only do you fail to see their humanity, you fail to see the divinity in them. You miss the Imago Dei. Mm -hmm. um, you miss seeing God's face in Amen. their face. Amen. And the reason why um, black people can be brutalized is because the image of God has been missed in black people. We are just black people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're not Rudy and mm -hmm. Cynthia. We are this mass, this one mind, this one thing. Um, and so going into what you're saying, um, I, I think when we think about race, we think about it too simply. Mm -hmm. and it's similar to what I'm saying about we're not a single story. Mm -hmm. um, I'm like a church, a church like mine. Uh, a lot of people feel like um, because they have a diverse church, they've done it. As if, di as if diversity, like, as if diversity is the end goal. Yeah. No, diversity is step one. Yes. Yeah. Diversity matters. Yes. Please, yes. Diversity matters, um, but it's just step one. Mm -hmm. And so I, I believe we all need to set up a progression of, of, of racial progress. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, diversity is, we share the same space mm -hmm. and that can be educationally. Yep. Um, so you need to read some books that are written by African-American authors yep. are people of color. Mm -hmm. um, that, that can be relationally. You need to um, sit across and have meals with people. Um, that can be institutionally. You need to hire people who are different than you. Um, yes. Race, yes. gender, and ec economic status. Yep. Yes. Um, step two would be unity. Uh, unity means we, we share the same banner. Mm -hmm. So like if you're on the Lakers, there's an automatic unity because of the banner on the front. Mm -hmm. Well, well for, for us, that banner is Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Mm -hmm. And it, it is the one thing that has held us together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The one thing that has held us together is the fact that we share this banner mm -hmm. and we keep coming back to Jesus. Mm -hmm. but, but that's not the end game either. Mm -hmm. um, from, from unity, we gotta get to community. Mm -hmm. um, and community means we, we share our lives together. Mm -hmm. um, this means uh, I, I'm at your kid's graduation. Um, I, I beat the pastor to the hospital because we do life together. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I shit, we, we do, we, we celebrate together. That's, that's mm -hmm. community. Yeah. But the ultimate goal is solidarity. Yeah. Uh, we share the same pains. Mm -hmm. Until all people hurt the same way, no matter what people are hurting, mm -hmm. um, we will never get to seeing the, the true humanity, the authentic humanity, mm -hmm. the humanity in the garden, mm -hmm. the Imago Dei. Wow. Um, there's stages uh, and, and yeah, so we've got to be careful thinking it's it's wow. a simple one step. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's a lifestyle. Correct. Yeah, it's a um, lifestyle. And there's a there's a fatigue that comes with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I think black people are experiencing that fatigue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And black people have to keep fighting to forgive, mm -hmm. keep mm -hmm. fighting for the cause. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but so do white people. So mm -hmm. do Asian people, and so mm -hmm. do um, Latin, mm -hmm. um, Chicano, yeah. Hispanic, Spanish. Uh, and I'm saying all those terms yeah. because they don't all accept 
any of those terms. Sure. Mm -hmm. And so we have to try to try to get in their lane. I want to say this last thing. I feel yeah. like I'm talking too Please, much. Please, no, you're, what you're um, saying right now. I am so grateful for what I'm seeing in, uh, in the peaceful protests. Yeah. Um, when I look out and see um, Asian people yeah. in solidarity, mm -hmm. and I see Latin, um, Hispanic, Mexican people mm -hmm. in solidarity, mm -hmm. uh, when I see white people in solidarity, yes. um, the the millennials and Gen Z have given me some hope mm -hmm. um, that it can be. So this fight mm -hmm. may not be for my generation. Mm -hmm. It might be for their children, yeah. um, but the fight is worth fighting. Amen. 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 You, you just yeah. dropped so much gold right there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Yeah. That would be a good part to go back and rewatch when we post this That's on so YouTube. Good. You need to listen to that mm -hmm. and, and own that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to own that. Mm -hmm. Sheesh. chewing on that Rudy I'm thinking of how you you um, you've exemplified that I think about when I first even came here um, none of my white friends took the drive up to come say this is awesome look at what God's doing glad that you're here it was Rudy that drove up met me in this building walked around this building and we prayed together and we said wow God it's going to be my brother. Right. It's, it's really that simple. Right. Yeah. I love seeing our divinity. Yeah. Mm. That purpose that we are created in the image of God. Mm. And it's just that. That's it. It's just That's it. that. Hallelujah. I, I, I think we could sit here and, and keep talking for hours. Mm. Um, and, and I think we definitely need to press into this and even get some other voices involved in this, but I want to take maybe the last few minutes here, and um, this is going to be loaded. I'm just going to give you that. Um, if you had one thing to convey to people right now, what is it? Uh, I'll go first and I'll let you guys close Yeah, yeah you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, to black people, um, I've already said it. Um, fight to forgive, um, but stay in the fight. Um, we have a tendency to either forgive or to be in the fight. Um, and we have to do both. Um, to white people, um, fight to listen. Fight to listen. Um, everything has been set up so that you don't need to hear, you don't need to understand. You don't have to experience the pain, but if I'm your brother, you gotta fight to understand. You gotta fight um, to listen. And the last thing I wanna say is I wanna thank you, Kevin. I wanna thank you for being w willing to take the pushback and the criticism for being willing to have this conversation. Thank you for, for, for your courage. It's because I love you guys. Yeah. Me too. And uh, even if these cameras weren't there, I think you guys would know that. I hope you guys would know that. And I think having witnessed it firsthand with friends, peers, yeah. you know that something needs to change. John, what about you, my friend? You know, uh, I'm gonna speak as a police officer right now. Um, I think for black people, uh, open your hearts to those uh, officers who are out there fighting to do the right thing. Yeah. And for those who have done wrong, we still need to learn to forgive um, because that's what God would do. And then also be willing to open your mouth in dialogue with your law enforcement agencies and the people out there because they need to hear your voice and the pain and the things that you suffered with in your communities and the struggles that you've had because it matters. And for law enforcement, I think we need to dialogue with the people in our communities more to get a better understanding of what they are, of what it is that they're going through and they've gone through uh, so that we can all build that bridge and come together and be united and the right things can be done. It's a good word, John. Yeah. Good word. You know, I'd say black people, get involved. Mm -hmm from a civic level. Hmm. Don't give up and just become isolated. Hmm. Use your voice to be a part of a change. Hmm. 
and constantly have conversations about forgiveness. Have a conversation about not every situation is a racial situation. Mm. And mm. I would say too that white people, mm. your ears to listen and to begin to accept narratives that are true and not what you see in the media. Yeah. That you will become to embrace us as, as your brothers and your sisters. And that the church, yeah. that we would be delivered and that we would uproot yeah. the deep, 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 long generation root of racism. And that's from both spots. And so I know God is gonna do it because I believe the Holy Spirit is gonna reign. I, be I believe the, the gavel of God has now come down on his church. Yeah. And he's saying, I need you to be a just people. Mm. And all of us play a role in that justice. Mm. And so for me, I go home and I often have to speak to myself mm -hmm. and say, Lord, let me not be one that thinks that's encounter that I just had with a white person, that I don't take that in for bitterness. Mm -hmm. I'm throwing that off because that's a weight. Mm -hmm. Help me to love people. Help me to know that souls matter. Yeah. Help me to be a refresher of hearts and help me to bring unity and speak up when it's purposeful and when it's transformational. And I say that's for white, black, whoever. Yeah. We have to be transformational leaders yeah. because transformation will break open the kingdom of heaven yeah. and God will pour out a blessing. Yeah. Wow. Okay, well, can I put you on the spot? Please. What do you want to say to white people? These are our brothers and sisters. I, I, I think I'll say what I've been praying is that scales would fall off of our eyes. And we would allow heart transformation to take place. That we would say, search me, oh God. And no. That we would acknowledge the difference. That we would celebrate and press into the difference. Mm. I think that's all I have right now. <laughs> Amen. I haven't slept much, my friend. Amen. No, amen. <laughs> um, would you pray? Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Thank you, Jesus. Heavenly Father, we're uh, awed by your presence, mm -hmm. dependent upon your grace. Forgive us for overlooking your mercy. God, wreck our hearts for the things that wrecks God's heart. And if Jesus would pray earnestly that we might be one, might we live in full conviction in that oneness, God, seeking unity, seeking authentic community, pressing into solidarity. God, there's a reason why Jesus prayed that we would be one. He knew we would fight amongst ourselves that we would fail to see one another. Help us to see each other the way you see each one of us, God. God, I, I, I am grateful, Lord, for this conversation. I pray, Lord, that as the first sermon pricked hearts, that this, this discussion, God, will prick hearts. And we will ask the necessary question, what must I do? God, the prophet said we have to do justice. It's not about having good hearts. We have to do justice. Show us what to do, God. Give us the courage to do justice. God, let our love for you be seen in how we love one another. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. Amen. God bless you, Lighthouse. We love you. Have a wonderful, wonderful Sunday. Uh, stay tuned. We have a couple more things we want to share with you today. God bless you guys. Love you.